So welcome to the uh, second panel of the afternoon, online advertising, the nuts and bolts of digital, mobile, and online television. Um, we have a lot to cover during this panel, and um, so we're, we're going to try to end, let's see, probably shortly after five. So, so I'm going to uh, only briefly introduce the panelists. You should all have their full bios um, in, a, in a printed uh, with the agenda. So I'll go through it alphabetically, starting to my far right. Kevin Eriks is Senior Vice President of Dish Media Sales, where he's responsible for Dish TVs and Fling TVs advertising sales, analytics, and operations. He leads the team in charge of the company's advanced advertising initiatives, which includes cross-platform addressable, programmatic sales, and dynamic ad insertion. And hopefully he'll tell us a little bit more about the meaning of those terms. <laughs> uh, next to him, we have Joshua Lokok, who is the Executive Vice President and Chief Legal and Brand Safety Officer at UM, where he leads digital strategy and innovation across all US accounts, including Coca-Cola, BMW, CVS Health, Sony, and USPS. He's also the architect of the uh, Forays Advertiser <coughs> Protection Network. <coughs> Immediately to my right is uh, Preston McA McAfee, who is an economist who's worked extensively in pricing, auctions, and I trust business strategy, market design, computational advertising, and machine learning applied to exchanges. After 28 years as a <coughs> university professor, uh, Preston joined Yahoo in 2007 as chief economist, moved to Google in 2012, and joined Microsoft as chief economist in 2014, from which he retired last year. Then to my left, Wendy Mo is the Associate Dean of Master's Program, Dean's Professor of Marketing, and Co-Director of the Smith Analytics Consortium at the University of Maryland's Robert H. Smith School of Business. She's an expert in online and social media marketing with a focus on analytics, and has consulted on these topics for Fortune 500 corporations and government agencies. Next to Wendy is Larry Solov, who is President, CEO, and General Counsel of Breitbart News Network a news media company he co-founded with the late Andrew Breitbart in 2007. The company has offices in Los Angeles and London and bureaus in Washington, Jerus Jerusalem, and Rome. And uh, finally, at my far left is Greg Stewart, who is the CEO of the Mobile Marketing Association, a global media trade group focused on mobile marketing. MMA <coughs> has more than 800 member companies globally and employees, uh, uh, employees in 15 countries. And the board includes chief marketing officers from Marriott, Uber, Walmart, and Samsung, among others, plus senior executives from Facebook, Google, Twitter, and Snap. Uh, so now I'm going to give each of the panelists an opportunity to uh, tell us a little bit more about their views, uh, their work, <coughs> and the role of their organizations in digital advertising. Um, so let's go down the table, and we'll start with you, Kevin. Thank you. Um, so Dish Media, the, the, I think the, the important things are the, the assets that we have, which is Dish Satellite Television and Sling TV. Uh, when, when you look at the topic of, of digital, uh, Sling TV is, is right there. It is live television uh, served over the top, uh, and it is digital because it is IP delivered, uh, and it gives you all the functionality that you, that you get from digital, uh, digital advertising and digital media. Uh, so I'm from Universal McCann, we're a media agency. Uh, what that means is we plan, strategize and define where media is going to be bought on behalf of our clients. The key point there is we're an agent for our clients. So we influence decisions, our clients make the ultimate decision where advertising is going to be placed. We also have the role of brand safety, so I'm responsible for ensuring our clients' ads run in brand safe environments and also helping keep the industry accountable and keeping the platforms accountable for getting rid of inappropriate content that's online. So are the, and we should have uh, some slides available for Preston. So um, I was responsible, uh, involved in digital advertising at Yahoo and Google, also at, at Microsoft. Uh, and I wanted to start out by saying why uh, judging advertising uh, effectiveness is hard. You heard in the previous panel that it's hard. You didn't hear very much about why. Uh, one thing that's hard to do with advertising is the counterfactual. Um, so that is to say, when, when and actually let me just give an example that was in the Harvard Business Review. Uh, people who saw brokerage ads were 1,600% more likely to open a brokerage account than people who didn't see brokerage ads. 
And the article didn't notice that, huh, people who saw brokerage ads searched for the word brokerage. They are different people than the people who didn't see the word brokerage ads, a different kind of people. Let me give an example of that. Can we go to the next slide, please? So this is, a, this is real data from a, um, from, oh, I, I have control. <laughs> this is real data. A company, a Fortune 500 company tells me, we've measured our advertising effectiveness on the, on the horizontal axis is our ad spend, on the vertical axis is our revenue, our in-store, same-store revenue, and the line through them tells us our, uh, uh, the effectiveness of our ad, our ad spend. And then when asked why they sometimes spend more than others, oh, we spend more at Christmas. So the theory under which that line measures the effectiveness of ads is the theory which is, if you don't advertise, Christmas doesn't happen. Right, that's the theory. Okay, the, the, so, so besides the counterfactuals, there's been a history of poor measurement. You hear a lot about TV, but what you don't hear is, has anyone ever measured the effectiveness of TV? And the answer to that is approximately speaking, no. Um, and so it's just been believed, why? Because our grandfathers believed it, not because it's uh, been effectively measured. And then the final thing I'll say is, is that uh, people who sell ads are marketing professionals. They are the best in the world at convincing people to buy stuff. So it's not surprising that they convince people to buy advertising. <laughs> and with that, I'll turn it over. <laughs> Thank you. That sets me up very well from uh, the marketer's perspective. So I am a um, professor of marketing, and the best way to give you a sense as to what my perspectives are is to um, give you uh, is to introduce my, my history. So I started in the field about 20 years ago um, in terms of research. And at that point, internet was just getting started. And prior to that, I had worked at AC Nielsen, um, bas basically measuring advertising effectiveness on sales. Um, and over, over my career, as the data changed, uh, my research focus changed, moving from understanding online consumer behavior to measuring the effectiveness of online advertising in, in terms of last click and attribution models and then moving on to more recently social media analytics and how that can help measure brand. Um, one of the things that I loved hearing about in the earlier uh, talk was the issue of the marketing or purchasing funnel. And the way I think about it is, you know, in each stage of my career, I focus on a different channel of advertising. Um, and when the internet first started, advertising on the internet was just like any other form of advertising, just in a, in a different channel. It was just like TV broadcast. It was just banner ads on websites. Um, over time, as the data got caught up and the tracking caught up um, and the analytics caught up with the ability to individually track, monitor, and measure, that's when the internet became this different vehicle. Uh, and we started looking at how do we reach, uh, how do we measure individuals, how do we predict individuals, how do we figure out who their friends are so that we can reach their friends, et cetera. And so uh, over time, it's the, the landscape has uh, evolved. And from my perspective now, we still have these different channels and different types of ads hitting different parts of the marketing funnel. So you have some of the larger, uh, larger banner ads, and the direct ads and the television ads going after top of the top of funnel consumers, and the targeted internet um, direct ads. Sorry, the targeted ads on uh, Facebook throughout the internet. Those more capture behavior at the bottom of the funnel. And so there is a there is a argument to be made that the two are complementary in some way. Sure, sure. So uh, I'm Larry Solov again. I run Breitbart News. Andrew Breitbart and I were best friends and next door neighbors uh, growing up. And since 2012, when Andrew unfortunately passed too early, I have um, dedicated my life to uh, promoting his mission and legacy, which is, you know, among other things, to democratize uh, the news coverage and to allow more voices, not fewer, at the table. Um, it is only by the free flow of information and ideas and a robust discussion and iteration on those ideas that our democracy uh, you know, is preserved and in fact grows and thrives. So uh, as a publisher with that 
point of view, I think that, um, please understand that that's my approach to these issues when I speak about them. Hi, uh, my name is Greg Stewart. I'm the uh, global CMO, uh, CEO of the uh, Mobile Marketing Association. Uh, I am a nonprofit trade association. Uh, unlike the previous panel, I'm not here with any agenda. Uh, I asked my attorneys if DOJ calls, do I go down? They said, yes, you should go there. <laughs> so that's the only reason I'm here, because they advised it. Um, Listen, um, fundamentally, you can understand a trade group by who its board is. And as mentioned earlier, my board is uh, controlled and run the majority by CMOs, major CMOs of uh, large corporations. So that's where we sort of fixate. Whatever we can do to help them architect the future of marketing. That's fundamentally what the group does. And we do that in initiatives in uh, measurement, organizational design, brand safety, uh, mobile fraud, all the issues that sort of can either support or plague an industry. Uh, we try to address collectively. I also do have Google, Facebook, Snap, a number of the other digital media companies. So we're a holistic group trying to solve these problems collectively is really what we're about as a group. So. Thank you, Greg. Uh, so before we get into the, some of the complexities of digital advertising, I, I just want us to start with the basics. And uh, Wendy, you touched on this in, in some of your opening remarks, but I was hoping you could elaborate. You know, what are the different forms of digital advertising? And what can you tell us about their respective purposes? So, so the way I think about it is we have the, um, the more traditional banner ads that have been around for a very long time who have, uh, was probably mirrors the offline um, advertising on TV and print media most similarly. And those are targeted in much the same way that print advertising, magazine ads, and TV ads are, are targeted in that you look for the venue that most, uh, with, the, with the audience that most matches the audience you're trying to trying to reach. And so it's a much broad, broader audience. And you know, earlier, um, one of the panelists referred to it as waste. I tend to refer to it as opportunities. Um, and I'll, I'll elaborate more on that as I start going after I go through the other, the other types of ads, the way I see them. The other type are the more targeted, whether it's search, um, <coughs> through an ad network, uh, or through your <coughs> social media feed, those targeted ads basically are micro level. They're looking at individuals, tracing their behavior across various parts of the internet to try and assess what it is that those individuals are most likely to buy. And that relates to what Preston just early, uh, just commented on, that uh, <coughs> those targeting algorithms aren't necessarily looking for opportunities or new customer opportunities, but they're looking to predict who's likely going to buy. So personally, I think that's where the waste is, that you're offering ads and charging brands for ads um, to reach customers who had a high probability of buying your product anyway without the ad. Versus if you were to go to a um, purchase a banner ad or a television ad, you reach people who maybe you wouldn't have considered before but may still be interested in your product because they're similar in some way to the other people who, have, who are interested. And so from that perspective, um, individual brands, by over-targeting, are missing opportunities to reach new customer groups. And from a consumer's perspective, um, those that, when there's too much heavy targeting, they don't get to see the other options out there that may be a good fit for their, for, for their own taste and preferences. They don't see new ideas. Um, Thank you. No, that, that's really helpful. Um, so, so as you all know, one of the core questions that we hope to answer, um, or at least ask during this workshop, is the extent to which different advertising markets are substitutable. So now that Wendy has told us a little bit about some of the different forms of digital advertising and their purposes, uh, Preston, I was hoping that maybe you could talk a little bit about substitutability. Sure. <coughs> um, let me follow up on, on what Wendy said as a, as a uh, preface to answering that, which is that uh, historically there was this quite sharp division between search and display, where search ads were text ads, they were targeted almost primarily on keywords, uh, whereas display ads would be richer media, graphic ads, or even video, um, and uh, would be on web pages other than search pages. And that's been blurred uh, uh, a lot. Shopping ads have blurred the distinction on search ads because now on search pages you see graphic ads that are, that are known as shopping ads. 
They also do a fair bit of targeting besides geo. You can target uh, personal characteristics on search pages, time of day, as well as, as uh, uh, customer age and so on. Um, and uh, I actually like to describe advertisers on a continuum. And, and I'm uh, fortunate from the previous panel because on one end of the continuum is Procter & Gamble. And they are almost entirely about the brand. That is, very few of us click on an ad and buy shampoo. A rare event. So that's not their market. Their market <coughs> is getting me when to putting it in my head that when I'm in the store, I should buy their shampoo and not some other shampoo. That is, at a, at a subsequent time. So they're all about the brand and not about the click. And then meanwhile, you have on the far end of the spec, the other end of the spectrum, malware distributors. Malware distributors get nothing unless you click on their ad, in which case they install a uh, rootkit in your computer. Uh, and so, so uh, and in between, you have performance ads and other kinds of ads where, where uh, they value a click, but they also value their brand, and they're, they're trying to do a different uh, message. So when you think about substitutability, you really want to cross that with what kind of advertiser are we talking about? And uh, things like brand safety matter tremendously at the P&G side, not so much if you're a Russian troll. Um, and so, uh, and so I, I don't tend to think of there being an answer that these two markets are substitutable. It's rather that these markets are substitutable for this kind of, uh, for this kind of company. And in, in the, the, the re, you know, one of the reasons, t t all right, let me uh, add one more thing and then I'll try to actually stop. Um, uh, the other thing that's worth knowing is there's, there's been this question about why did, did um, you know, who is it that watches five hours of TV? Is there anybody in the room that watches five hours of TV every day? Because this is like the national median, right? Is, is, uh, that's declined somewhat. They don't want to raise their hand. Yeah. <laughs> so, so um, and who is it that didn't adopt computers? About a third of America never adopted broadband. Who are those people? The answer is the, the, the desktop computer world is very unfriendly if you're not a good speller. It just is. So, so there's a sociologist who said uh, you, you can account for most of the people who didn't adopt broadband are the same people who didn't read a novel in the last 12 months. This, this is the, the desktop world was unfriendly to people who uh, are, are marginal spellers. Let me put it that way. And the thing that's really interesting is that the mobile world is not. The mobile world is friendly to all of us. And as a consequence, it's got way, you know, one of the highest adoption rates of any device in America or any uh, product in America. And so when I think about uh, digital, I actually split the mobile world, which is a really good world, except for the 1.7 second attention span. Uh, it's a really good world for reach, better than TV. But not a uh, but not so good at uh, at depth, and so so that's really the thrust of my answer, which is they're substitutes, but they're not perfect substitutes. Thank you. I, that's helpful, and I think we're gonna we'll go back to to, to mobile. We'll, we'll talk to Greg about that. But first, maybe if Joshua, um, you know, it'd be helpful to hear about some of these issues from an ad, ad agency perspective. You know, how, how do advertisers or how how do you um, advise advertisers to allocate ad spend across first digital and non-digital media, and then what about within digital? Uh, for example, how do you decide whether to allocate ad dollars to search versus display versus video advertising? And then also, if you could just talk to talk to us about who makes the decisions where to advertise. Is it the advertisers, the ad agency, um, some inter other intermediary? Uh, so, a lot of things there to unbundle. Uh, <laughs> I'll start like, we make recommendations on how to allocate sort of independent of the channel. It all starts with a campaign objective. So we service our clients, our clients give us a brief, that brief has objectives for a campaign. And that could be a brand building campaign, a short term performance campaign. I think one of the things that hasn't come up today, which is important to factor in, is time and the length of time that we have to operate that campaign in. And to Preston's slide about Christmas, like. If it's, if it's holiday or Black Friday, there's a lot more pressure on shifting spend to traditional media because you need to hit that reach of an audience quickly, whereas if it's outside of those campaign constraints, <coughs> you've got more independence. We plan media against data, so where it all starts with a customer, 
<coughs> like who the customer the client's trying to reach, that customer at the end is going to be consumer, so we want to measure effectiveness against that. And then we want to be able to find them and identify them on channels. We don't plan television, radio, print, out of home in silos. We plan them holistically, so there's not a TV planner, there's an integrated video planner, there's not a radio planner, there's an integrated audio planner. Uh, from the buy, like from the sell side, it might seem independent of that because if you're a seller of media, you might actually only negotiate with one person. But from an agency strategy and planning perspective and from the data we use, we look at consumers holistically because consumers are complex animals. If I asked anyone to raise their hand, nobody would raise their hand and go, I only watch TV, I only watch radio, I only look at out of home. Like, you consume multiple channels, so what we look at is the consumer behaviour across multiple channels. You heard earlier from Susan and others about multi-touch attribution, so we're identifying the audience, the consumer, we're enriching as much data as we can all the way down that path, and then we're looking at the impact and constraints of media across all of those channels. So TV drives search, search can drive TV behaviour, it can drive consumption of content, everything interrelates, it's not straightforward. On the search side of things, it's getting increasingly more complex, because I'm trying to remember everything you asked. On the search side, it gets increasingly more complex because Search can serve mobile, you can have deliberate, and I used to work on the P&G business in China of all places, people can search for individual products, so they can search for Tide, so you might buy the keyword on Tide, or they might search for something like stain removal, so then you look back at campaign objectives, is it higher funnel, like I'm trying to understand how to remove stains, I'm trying to get my brand out there, so you're using search for branding, or it can be very product purchase focused, trying to get people to your individual site. Where search gets really interesting today is it's very easy from a market definition perspective to talk about Google and Bing as search engines, but Amazon is increasingly considered a search destination. Pinterest is increasingly considered a search destination. Facebook's a search destination, and all of those environments are where you're buying search keywords. So to, you know, to sort of challenge Preston's point of no one types in shampoo and clicks on an ad, and then buy shampoo, I'm buying search ads on YouTube that might result in people then going to Walmart and then buying a product, or I'm buying search ads on Walmart or Amazon that result in people buying a product, and I'll have brand advertising associated with that. So you will buy, and I, I know I'm not making it easy, but in the complexity of definition of a market, like I will buy brand advertising on Amazon because if people search for shampoo, I might want to push head and shoulders for P&G, I might also want to buy the keyword that gets people to buy a particular product. I might push a brand messaging to show the benefits and efficacy of the product, or I might just put, get people to add it to their cart. It's very complex and I get back to it. It all depends on what the client briefs on as a campaign objective. And then we make recommendations based on what we think is the best fit for finding that audience to deliver against the campaign objective. <coughs> we make recommendations to a client. The client ultimately signs off on that except when we get to programmatic, but that's like another 15 minute speech. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, Karina, yeah. Karina if, I could, if I could comment a little bit, because I've probably have, have done, personally done more cross-media research than probably most people, upwards of now three dozen studies publicly, both when I ran the IAB, when we were trying to develop internet advertising as a business, and now for mobile. And I'll tell you what's interesting about the whole cross-media thing is that um, if you do measure media and you look to see what's really going on there and you're trying to understand a number of different factors, a reach, as was mentioned earlier, cost certainly factors in, message is a good component of that. There's so many things that come into it and it varies dramatically by campaign objective, by category, by audience going after. Because fundamentally what you're trying to do is match your brand's marketing efforts and media allocations to the consumer behavior patterns and then influenced by individual creative messages. So I've seen campaigns uh, even of late in the last five years where print was the number one performing channel. And, you know, I'm the head of the MMA, so I typically wouldn't say something like that, right? Wouldn't be sort of the role that we're going to say, but that's fine. We're all about how marketers do it more effectively. So you look at a peer sort of return on investment of media and you can measure well. I do think you can do that with, as mentioned, multi-touch attribution. Um, it's all over. Uh, TV still would be anywhere between, what well, we've seen the studies most in the last five years, 38% to upwards of probably 65% <coughs> of the total mix. TV still has that kind of relevance. Untargeted, linear, dare I say boring old TV in some regards still really works. So it's just, it is a very complicated question and I believe that there is a lot of movement between those channels. Where it's gotten extra hard, and Joshua and, and his company would certainly force, there are so many options today. 
There is so many choices that it's almost incomprehensively overwhelming. We did a little thing for another project the other day. We heard it just within video and audio that there was probably 1,055 combinations that you could pull together of different formats, targeting capabilities, sound on, sound off. I mean, it's just, it's infinite now. And that's part of what's making this world so complicated, at least for marketers in the world, the world that they're trying to do on behalf of their, you know, ultimately their shareholders. And now, actually, if you can tell us a little bit about mobile specifically, um, I think, you know... Preston mobile rocks. <laughs> that, um, you know, digital really took off with mobile. Yeah. I think I'd read that more than half of mo marketers' digital ad spend last year was on mobile. Um, are, so, so how do advertisers approach mobile? Is it independent from the rest of digital? Uh, do they think about different forms of mobile differently for like, video, in-app, display? Yeah. Can you tell us a little about that? No, I think I'll really pick, I'll sort of carry on one step to what I was saying didn't so far. Uh, I think what's happened in mobile, uh, I, I had a friend of mine, a guy was at Colgate, and he said, he used to talk to me, he goes, you internet guys. <laughs> That's how he talked to me. He said, you internet guys, he goes, you, you came along, you did like internet video and internet search and you did internet display and you know, that was kind of, you know, like there was a couple of choices. He goes, and they said, now you mobile guys, he says, you've given me so many options. Like it's almost overwhelming the choices that I have that I can go in and try to figure out. And so I, I think that again, we're really struggling with not having the best of, I think measurement does exist. I disagree with some of what's been said earlier. I have measured media. It is very possible to measure media. I have high confidence in using experimental design to do that. So I don't know if there's smarter researchers here that take that to task, That's so be it. Um, I think you can, and I think markers have an obligation to figure that out. I, I don't buy this like you, you, know, you can't do it. So, um, so that's part of the challenge. But I think the issue with, um, I think that what's happening though, is to kind of get back to your question, is that there's, uh, there's just so much experimentation as we try to slot these things in to try to bring comprehension to an incredibly complicated space. And that's what's making it, I think, so hard for marketers because they just, they, they had, you know, it was just a simpler world before where you could slot stuff in and you knew what its purpose was and you could, you know, fool yourself to think that that was all there was. I'm not sure that was really the case at the time, but, but, um, but now it just, it just, I just don't think that they, that they know. And by the way, in my previous studies, I mean, we've seen mobile, I don't think mobile is 50% of total spend. I don't think it's anywhere near that today for most marketers. And I wouldn't advocate that. Our research would suggest that mobile, generally we've seen 15 to 20% of a total of the full stack, TV, everything, outdoor, uh, print, any, anything else that's in the mix, digital, desktop. Um, and, but we have seen studies that say it could be as high as 35% on an optimized basis. And so, I don't know, oh, sorry, it gets so core of yours, but. I, I think what contributes to that, though, is is when you look at Facebook and Google spend, which uh, has as you know is is high, and the majority of the consumption for Facebook and, and Google is done on a mobile device. I think that sort of checks the box for mo mobile. Yeah. Um, so I think you have to take that into consideration when the when those stats are that high. Makes sense. Um, we. So, I, Kevin, I want to get back to you and, and talk a little bit about online TV. Um, but first, just because we've been hearing about the, the marketer's perspective on things, um, Larry, you know, it would be great to hear how publishers are thinking about digital advertising. So for example, you know, what's the most important factor when publishers are looking to move inventory? Um, <clears throat> so there's a lot to unpack here. And um, there's no way to completely get into all of it in the amount of time that we have. So I'm going to paint with some broad brush, and I hope you guys will understand that. Plus, I never get you all together in one place, so I want to take advantage of it. Um, digital online advertising is not sold like television or print advertising. Um, instead, it is sold almost entirely on a programmatic basis. And what that means is it's sold at, on an auction with real-time bidding. And there's a lot of implications of the switch to programmatic that has happened over the last several years. Um, one of which is that when I started, um, uh, an advertiser would say, uh, you know, I look at your demographics on your site and you've got 20 million unique visitors a month and and uh, I want to hit them generally, so I'm going to do a $150,000 ad buy at a certain CPM on your website. Great. Because of programmatic advertising, direct advertising has, display advertising online has almost disappeared for all intents and purposes. And 
advertisers do not buy websites and they do not buy publishers. They buy people. You guys all know this, right? Um, uh, last week, you thought, hey, I, I got a vacation later this year. I want to go to take the family to Hawaii, maybe do a Google search for you know, cheapest hotels in Hawaii, or you're a baller and you just look for like most expensive hotels in Hawaii or something, and maybe you look at airfare, and then for the next three weeks, wherever you go, you get ads from American Airlines, from the Outrigger Hotel, from maybe a, a hotel in the Caribbean that thinks, oh, this person lives in DC, Hawaii is pretty far away. If I serve them an ad, maybe they'll think I'll go somewhere shorter. You get the picture. And we see that all the time, it's remarketing. And it's very much connected very often to what you have searched or what other websites you've gone to. So that's you know, how things are done now. So the second key point is that Digital online programmatic buying is bought and sold on an exchange, just like commodities and just like equities. But there is a big, big difference. This exchange is completely and totally unregulated. And practically everything that the SEC would not allow you to do on a commodities or equities exchange happens every day, all the time, in this space. Um, also unlike a commodities or equity exchange, very often there's one company, happens to be Google, that for all intents and purposes controls everything. Google controls the entire pipeline, okay? So they control, and they have multiple products, they do it through multiple means. They control the, the um, demand side, the sell side, they control the exchange, they control DFP, the platform that I'm, I don't know a single publisher that does not use the DFP platform. I, I can't think of one. And the reason is, it'd be so cost effective and, and inconvenient to get off <coughs> of, and they've baked anti-competitive actions into DFP to discourage you from going anywhere else. Again, I'm giving you a lot it can be unpacked, you know, over time. Um, on top of that, Google actually owns many of the ad networks that are buying. Google actually buys off of this and in this system that it controls. And historically, that auction has taken place as a two-tier, two-stage auction, the first price and the second price. Historically, Google has reserved the last look in that process, which um, one could argue, uh, pretty convincingly, is a competitive advantage. Um, they also have information that the buyers and sellers don't have. You know, someone that wants to buy ads has to put in a bid estimating what they think other people are going to buy. At. Google puts in a bid, they know what everyone's already bid. So again, <laughs> a lot, the bottom line is the system is rigged and ripe with conflicts of interest. Google is trying to get ahead of this. They've just announced that they're switching to a single uh, stage auction process. I would submit that that will not solve the problem. Um, they will still be in a position to control who wins, where the advertising goes, uh, how much and which publishers get paid, and frankly, they'll still carve out a margin by the use of algorithms and other things. So <coughs> why should you care? Well, if you're an advertiser, you should care because you're probably paying more for ads than you should online. And if you're a publisher, you, care, you should care before because you are probably getting less money for your ad inventory than you should. It's a pretty opaque process. And I would submit, I will give you my personal opinion, everyone should care because no one tech and advertising company, especially one with a proven viewpoint bias, 
should have control over picking and chooser, choosing winners in publishing. Um, my takeaways would be, if you don't want heavy regulation, the only way to avoid it will be for the DOG to, DOJ to start looking into antitrust action. Otherwise, you're going to have to regulate. And the other thing I would submit to you is if you fix the problem today, Google is now so dominant in the space that any fix that is not remedial will not make a difference. Subject one. Uh, time for one more. Do you want to? Uh, well, so I think you've given us a lot to unpack. In that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I want to. I want to get to, to to subject two as well. But I also I know Wendy that that ad ad networks and and um, ad tech in general is something that you have also studied. And so I I just wanted to give you an opportunity to to talk about that as well. I mean, the roles of the different um, ad tech companies in in facilitating these transactions. So, so this is a tough spot for me to follow. Um, so I, I think, you know, I'll probably leave the details of how the bidding and all work to some of the gentlemen to my right who have more um, direct experience with it. From my perspective, um, I look at it more theoretically from um, the position of the role of targeted versus untargeted advertising and how broad-based is that targeting. Um, my sense, and again, I'm sure people on this panel will feel free to correct me if they disagree, is that the various um, ad outlets have, you know, it allow for various degrees of targeting. Um, my sense is that, so Larry focused on Google, um, I, I would actually throw in Google, Facebook, and Amazon into this targeting discussion in that you, you could work, brands can work with Google and Facebook for varying degrees of targeting. So if, so, if a brand wants to go target top of the funnel and not go um, micro target, that, that is a possibility. And the, the issue is, are there outlets? Are there appropriate pages? Are there content providers that provide the set of audience members that the brand is looking to um, target? Uh, I, I, seem, I vaguely remember, I'm hesitant to reveal this, to say this, is because I can't specifically remember the source, but I remember yesterday, um, some there was a news article that revealed that Amazon for the first time has surpassed Google in the number of product searches. Um, and so from that perspective, um, you know, if we're thinking about where the, the power of Google to direct product searches and consumers to their appropriate product, um, that is weakening and yielding to Amazon. Thank you. Um, and I, I don't want to completely shift gears, but I think that um, it, it's important to understand all of the, the, the different facets of um, digital advertising, and one, one important piece that we haven't spoken about yet is um, video advertising in particular, and how that exists obviously across a number of different media, including online television. And, and so Kevin, you know, I I'd love to hear from you about how online TV providers are thinking about digital advertising? You know, is it more similar to other forms that, that the panelists have been describing? Or um, is it more like ads on traditional TV? So maybe if you could tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, I, 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 um, I'll, I'll say that. I think everyone's getting a, a lot of digital loaded on them in a short period of time. <laughs> we went from you know, defining digital and what it means to um, a, a quick crash course in programmatic, which uh, has taken some a decade to figure out. Um, you know, I, I just going back, I, I'd be remiss not to say that I think digital all started with internet and it started with consumer optionality. You know, consumers had the chance to get content on a computer and while desktop is not as prevalent as mobile today, um, I, you know, I, I think, I think Everything about advertising is where the consumer is spending time. Um, I work at Dish now. Uh, I've spent the last 20 years in digital. 
uh, and we used to talk about how um, how much time consumers spent online and where the ad dollars were and ad dollars were still with traditional television and traditional media so that's caught up and um, there's been a handful of drivers of that but I think you have to look at digital as uh, it's it's IP delivered uh, it is uh, the ad executions on digital are our display our video and search and and that's simplifying it and then you have sort of walled gardens uh, platforms like a Facebook or Instagram or snap um, that are, are are all digital but they're they're bringing a slight coming from a slightly different angle anyway um, you know, Sling, Sling uh, basically was, was born, you know, four or five years ago from the, the, the need of, of consumers wanting another option than, you know, the, the sort of standard cable or satellite television uh, where they have, um, you know, hundreds of channels and they're like, well, I, I watch 20 channels and, and I want, you know, what is, what is commonly referred to today as a skinny bundle. And uh, so it really, it came from consumers. I mean, consumers demanded that and uh, Sling, you know, or, or Dish made a, you know, an acquisition of a company called Move Networks and, and that was the, that's the foundation of Sling today. And, and you know, our, our stats on Sling are, are, are public in terms of how many subscribers we have. But uh, in a nutshell, Sling is live television delivered OTT. And OTT, you know, again, just to sort of level set, you know, Part of what we do every day is, is make sure that we educate and define. OTT is a, over the top, so it is content that is delivered uh, through uh, someone's device. You know, for us, 90 plus percent of our consumption comes from the big screen in, in, in the home. Um, and, uh, and, and that is, uh, that is delivered via an IP signal um, and, not, and it is not going through sort of the you know, traditional cable or satellite subscription. Um, so uh, Sling to any consumer that has it looks and looks and feels to the consumer like live television because it, it is live television. It is the live television television feed that you would find when you watch TBS or TNT or NBC or, or whatever station is 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 uh, you're tuning into on Sling. But it 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 acts and it delivers uh, like digital because it all comes IP. So we're in a really interesting uh, section. I know in the earlier panel they talked about you know TV is not digital, and we actually are are right in the middle of the intersection of television and digital, um, and and I, I believe that the that intersection is all sort of tied to addressable advertising and is and is tied to uh, live television delivered uh, over the top, and and just to sort of you know this this isn't all about sling. I mean Directv Now, uh, YouTube TV. Uh, Hulu Live are, are the four main, um, you know, companies that that are in the live TV OTT uh, space, and so for digital, um, you know, we 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 actually uh, we view it as however our customer wants to buy. If someone wants to buy uh, via I/O, if, that's great. If someone wants to buy programmatic, we are fully connected into all the technology that enables someone uh, for the first time to buy live television uh, in in you know a nanosecond. Um, and so for us, digital advertising, uh, it gives us the flexibility to, to leverage um, either you know, existing third-party data or consumer, or sorry, uh, brand first-party data along with our subscriber data to deliver targeted advertising, to, address, to deliver addressable advertising. But in the end, uh, it, is, it, is, uh, it is all uh, digital delivered, data-driven video that, that we provide. Thank you. Um, I, I want to go back to some of the, the, the discussion took us to some of these intermediaries um, that, that play a role in uh, particularly in programmatic and in the transactions and so Preston I was hoping if you could talk to us a little bit more about uh, the role of programmatic and the ad networks. Absolutely. So, so uh, I want you to start by thinking about um, if you want to buy let's say a collectible Pez dispenser and those things exist uh, on eBay you go, there's a seller on eBay, eBay is a platform, you connect to that seller, you put in a bid, if you win the auction, you're done, they send you the, uh, you give the money and they give you a Pez dispenser. <coughs> this is not at all how advertising works, not at all. So um, first there are at least five ad networks, AdX, Amazon, AppNexus, OpenX, and Facebook Exchange all play the role of eBay. That is to say, in principle, an advertiser could be connected to one of those. Say, I would like to add. Publishers say, here's an opportunity. An opportunity is something like, you go to Breitbart, 
They then tell the, uh, the advertising exchange, here's who's on my site, here's what they're looking at, here's what I know about them. What they know about them, what they know about you could be a lot because maybe they have access to data from Experian that tells you, tells them what your IP address, uh, what your household income is, and so on. So, uh, and that could go through any of those five exchanges. And that's how it worked circa 2012. Starting uh, shortly after 2012, we see the rise of what's called a demand side platform. A demand side platform aggregates buyers, that is to say um, uh, advertisers, into larger groups. If I want to make an auction not work very well, have monopoly power, right? And that's what demand side platforms were all about, is if I get all the advertisers together, rather than submit the highest bid, the second highest bid, the third highest bid, and so on, I just submit one bid. <coughs> So, so that was a, it was a beautiful vision, the demand side platform. We're going to aggregate all the advertisers and we're in the process, in the, in the way we're going to help them also to do their job. But then what happens is there are multiple demand side platforms that compete against each other. There are at least five of those. So that is to say the advertiser puts their ad into a demand side platform. The demand side platform sticks it into not one, but all five of the exchanges, hoping to get a uh, publisher. Meanwhile, the publishers, so, so what this process did to the publishers is caused them to lose money, right? They're not making as much money because now there's power on the advertiser side. How did the publishers respond? They did the same thing. Those are called containers. A container is a group of publishers who run their own auction. So now what we have is, is a sequence of auctions being run by the different players in the marketplace with different levels of data and so, and so on. It has made it somewhat symmetric, but the, the thing that you need to understand about advertising is, is that everybody thinks they deserve half. So each of, the, uh, each of these parties, so that is, there's a publisher who's supposed to get the money in the end, but it, meanwhile, the, they run their ads through a container, which is just basically collecting the, uh, the, the publishing opportunities and running its own auction. It's getting bids from exchanges, each of which are taking a cut, generally substantially less than half, those then are getting bids from demand side platforms, each of which is taking roughly half. And then finally, there are, uh, well, and then they're actually advertising agencies because there are very few advertisers who actually ever participate in these markets. That is to say, they are represented by someone who also has creatives and all that. And so, uh, and, and in this process, what we now have is basically uh, three sets of auctions when one would have sufficed and been more efficient. So I, I, I would I would jump in and, and say that that is uh, that does not describe the programmatic world that we live in at all. Um, and uh, and 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 I think it's important for the audience to understand that there are different flavors. I think what um, what Larry and what you guys are describing is open auction and open auction is like everyone's putting in and it's display like there is a there is a there's so much display ad inventory. It's insane. You know, when you go to a web page, do you see one ad? No, you see five, right? And and so it's it's so commoditized. And so I think what you're describing is open auction, and it's messy. There's there's middle players, but in in our world for video, it is very clean and is very effective. And I'm not an advocate for programmatic. I'm an advocate for whatever solution my client wants. And we have uh, one partner that we run. Uh, they use their pipes to connect to the demand side, and that partner. Uh, gets paid uh, a fee by us, which is you know about to become transparent, you know, because the industry is asking for it, and uh, and then also gets paid by the demand side, and it eliminates the middle person, it eliminates all those you know four or five middle players. Uh, it's very effective, it's very clean, and uh, and I, and I think programmatic is very uh, it's it's hard to understand. I mean, it's 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 a it's complicated. Um, and it, but it has evolved. It started out as open exchange. It's very messy, uh, but there are other flavors. There's personal auctions. There's programmatic guaranteed. Uh, you can control however you want your inventory um, to exist. But but I I do think that the the deck is stacked not in the favor of the display publisher in programmatic open exchange. I think there's a couple of things we just need to <clears throat> and Kevin's spot on. There's a couple of things that need to be clarified, which is. Content and environment still matters. So while we chase an audience, quality environments matter. Reach still matters and effective reach still matters. So there's PMPs, there's private marketplaces which drive a lot of programmatic. 
and you know, consu while, consum while the media landscape's fragmented and consumers are going everywhere, you categorically know that there's, for any brand or advertiser, there might be 10 to 15 sites where you can reach 80% of the audience quite effectively in one go. And again, that's where you have to factor time into all of these decisions. The other thing that needs to be factored in is on the transparency side. There's a lot of work being done on supply path optimization, so you'll hear the term SPO bandied around in the industry. And that's about eliminating all those middlemen that are like clipping the ticket all the way through. And it's come from this perverse belief by, I'll say, the publisher side of the industry, which is every eyeball deserves to be monetized, and that's not true. The end result should be not every eyeball deserves to be monetized, and every, not every page deserves to carry an ad. It should be, an ad should only be served if it's highly relevant and needs to be there for the consumer. Otherwise, the publisher needs to make a decision not to carry an ad. And the reason why the industry's moved in the way that ads tend to be everywhere is so little of the traffic is actually direct. So once upon a time in a magazine, you turn the page, turn the page, and you'd sell 20 pages in a you know, 60 page magazine. What happens now is publishers get traffic from search, so then they're like desperately trying to monetize on someone who comes in, reads an article, and disappears, and they'll never see them again. So these are sort of the you know, dynamics that are going on. Um, before I switch gears and, and ask you all about data, I just wanted to give everybody at the side of the table an opportunity to, if you had anything to add to that. No? Okay. Um, you know, I, I want to go back to uh, something that, that you had started to touch on, Preston, um, when you were talking about the different, all of the things that uh, they know about you, these, these various intermediaries. And so, you know, we, it sounds like ad networks are responsible for collecting a lot of data. So perhaps you could describe some of the data that are being uh, gathered and maybe even if you could tell us a little bit about what is shared with advertisers or publishers and how the data is used generally. So, uh, um, sure. Um, first thing is, is that there's almost nothing about you that can't be known. Um, from your IP address, uh, both Axiom and, and Experian sell, they make money on selling data. So if you want uh, your financial wherewithal, have you bought a car in the last year, things like that, stuff, the stuff that would be in your credit uh, report, that data is available. Uh, the data, actually, for a, from an academic researcher perspective, is really a delight because it, you've seen your own credit report. It's very extensive about the big things. It's also quite expensive, so, so there are many advertisers that don't use it. S second, it's, it's pretty easy for an advertiser to track uh, what you do on their site. Excuse me, a publisher, to track what you do on their site, what pages you visit, how much <coughs> time you spend. Um, but by the way, th this isn't. Um, th there's there's academic research that 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 uh, was published by people who were at Yahoo and then later at Google that um, say we have a pretty good sense of what you're looking at on a page. Like you you probably think, well, it's the whole page. How could you know what I'm looking at? But it turns out um, people move their thing their mouse. At least on a desktop, they move their mouse where they're looking, or at least enough of them that we get a pretty good sense from the page what you're looking at. Um, with mobile, we actually even have a better sense, because uh, you don't probably don't know this, but people only use 85% uh, of their eye gaze goes to the top half of their screen. That is, you don't read the bottom half of your screen. You scroll to read the top half. So we know what you're, we have a pretty good sense of what you're looking at. Uh, what pages you visited, and then there's, let me tell you about cookie sharing. And, and um, cookie sharing is, and I think Larry uh, uh, mentioned this, um, so, so a cookie tell, like, they write into a cookie what you do on the site, so that it tracks in your browser, that is, it's on your computer, not stored necessarily off your computer, what you're doing on that site. And then cookie sharing means if I search for United Airlines and then I go to some other site, that other site can access the cookie that United left on my website, on my computer, and say, oh, he looked at this flight, let me offer him another flight, a competing flight or a similar flight, or maybe even exactly the same flight. That's what you get with Amazon, right? Is that uh, they just ask you, you know, show you the same product, sometimes embarrassingly. Um, that's not actually quite as bad as it sounds in the sense that it's not necessarily the advertiser seeing that. 
And then let me let me finish with just Facebook and Google. Uh, Facebook and Google basically don't let data off their own sites. That they are. Um, if you want to access Google data, you have to advertise on Google, not outside of Google. And that actually protects the consumer, and the same is true of Facebook. That is the Facebook data, and I'm not on Facebook, and yet Facebook still has extensive data about me, and that's because of the like button. Right? So, so, so the like button means when I go to a site that has the Facebook like button, Facebook, it, this is called pixeling, by the way. A pixel, if a publisher, excuse me, a, uh, uh, if, a, if a company controls one pixel on the page, they get to see everything that the browser supplies, including your IP address and so on. So that allows them to track your behavior. And <clears throat> some pages have as many as 2,000 people tracking you. Uh, one thing that's, that's true, so, so Facebook and Google require you to use the data on their site. They don't let the data out, and that's, that, that is consumer friendly. Um, but it also is sort of monopolization friendly because they have so, such extensive data. Um, uh, let me say, the, for the, let me finish with, there are really very simple things for consumers to do to limit all this, and almost nobody does. So, so that is to say, the, the cost to a consumer of having cookies not be written, like you can use the Brave browser, B-R-A-V-E, the, the, the name of a competing browser, it just prevents all those cookie writing. So consumers have a really low cost remedy that they don't take. And so, so that's a, that's a, uh, um, so that, that on the other side of all this, like they can see all this, they have tons of data, but we don't do the first thing, mostly as a society, to protect ourselves. Thank you. Uh, and because you you brought it, unless Wendy, yeah, yeah I just, I'd love to just add to that a little bit. Um, so I mean, Preston describes the process of collecting what pages you're looking at, um, what you're searching for, et cetera, but. I think from a um, marketer's perspective, the, the value in that data is what you can infer about the person in terms of their preferences, their lifestyles, et cetera. And, um, and so the idea is to, if you can observe someone behaving across the internet, you can, you can infer what this person's preferences for type of car, preferences for type of computer, um, political leanings, sports uh, sports preferences, interests, um, and so that is all extractable. However, there's still accuracy issues with that. Um, so I always use my when I teach this to my class, my students. I always use myself and my son as an example. So for myself, um, I read a lot of technology. I read a lot of business and finance. So all of my devices and all of my machines think I'm a man. Um, <laughs> My, we won't get into what my son, that's not necessarily <laughs> sure. But the po point is there are definitely accuracy issues and the larger the ad network, the more accurate, the more visibility they have in your behaviors. Um, the more visibility they have in your behaviors, the more accurate they become. And that's where we start see, I, I've thought a lot about Facebook versus Google and their size, the size of their footprint across the internet. So um, Google has, uh, a large footprint across all of their all of their sites as well as other content sites and anything that, that carries an ad. Facebook has actually an even bigger footprint um, in terms of their ability to observe your behavior within their platform. Um, anything that carries that Facebook like, any page that carries that Facebook like is visibility for them into your behavior. And on top of that, they have the social network the behavior of the friends in your social network, et cetera. And so it's, it's um, I, have, I don't know what the solution <coughs> is in terms of privacy and tracking, but it's just an interesting thought process that I always take my students through in terms of, Google is the poster child for tracking. But if you think about what, they, what all, the, all of these firms have insights into, it's not clear that they have the biggest footprint on your behavior. Thank you. Yeah, I, I wanted to continue that conversation. So you both obviously brought up Google and Facebook, and people have talked about increasingly Amazon um, as a, accounting for the majority of uh, digital ad spend. And you know, some people argue that they've been able to maintain their dominance through this walled garden approach. 
so you know, I would love to hear sort of how how people think um, you know the role of data and what actually that that walled garden approach means. And I think Greg, you you mentioned that you had some thoughts on this as well. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> You do now. So yeah, I mean, listen. I'll, I'll I'll just take a position that maybe other people can sort of disagree with. Um, you know, uh, so at the end of the day, I, I represent the marketer. So I sit with the marketers on it a little bit. And the thing that's caught me interested about the wall gardens. I mean, in some regards, you know, Google and Facebook have built very strong advertising businesses that really work for advertisers. They wouldn't use them if they didn't. And you know, in if they they have decided for whatever business reasons that they don't want to share everything out beyond that. And it seems to me that, you know, eventually uh, the economic marketplace may decide that they can continue to do that or not. I, I don't know what's going to happen. I do know that there are a lot of companies, publishers, not that far below in size, not in the kind of sort of uh, usage that we see, but if you look at um, you know, companies like CBSI, who has extensive internet properties and mobile properties, or Meredith, there are a number of other sort of companies out there. Um, you know, they sit at just, you know, if Google and Facebook sit around 210 million uh, uniques, according to what Comscore says on a monthly basis, they sit in the 180, 190 million range. They're also equal size, and they will share the information. So there are options out there, and so I don't know, I kind of don't, I get the, hyst I guess in some regards, I get the hysteria that might exist because somebody's not sharing something back with me, but. For the moment, it seems to be like a business decision that they've made that for whatever reasons they've decided to do that. And so I don't, I'm sure that's going to be contradictory to a lot of other people. But um, I, I'm surprised that markers don't find other options. If they really wanted that, they'd go develop the other options. I'd like to weigh in there. Because <laughs> uh, there's a couple of, there's, a, there's two parts of the conversation really, which is there's the supply of inventory and there's the supply of data. And media and media buying and planning is really the convergence of both of those things these days. And you know, there's companies like Amazon, Google, Facebook. You know, they need to be named. They have a concentration of power on both sides, and that is advantageous for them in the entire ecosystem. And then I want I don't want to paint them as monopolies. That's up for the DOJ to decide. The real question that needs to be sorted out is. It's the consumer behaviour that concentrates the, then the buying decisions that flow from that. So even if they were independent companies or the fragmentation in the marketplace, because consumers spend so much time on YouTube, on an Android device, on Google search, that's where the, that's where the power comes from and that's where they get a disproportionate share of the spend. And that's the same for the Facebook ecosystem and quite frankly that's the truth for the Amazon ecosystem as well. If you unstitch all of that and say well they need to share the data outside of their wall gardens, that's interesting and you know a powerful argument. The flip side challenge of that is it doesn't change the consumer behaviour which is consumer behaviour is concentrated on a handful of platforms anyway. So even if I can pick up Facebook's data or Amazon's data and you know, Preston mentioned Facebook Exchange and Amazon sells media elsewhere and Google sells media elsewhere. It doesn't change the fact that consumer behaviour is dominated and consumer interest is dominated on a few core environments. And then everything else is sort of the mid to long tail. Thank you. And I think that's the traditional argument um, for targeting. And so there are, there are larger discussions about um, food deserts, right? So you have valuable consumers in um, high-income neighborhoods who are who everyone wants to try and reach. Alternatively, you have other consumers who, uh, and, and because everyone's targeting those high-value consumers, there's price competition, there's a lot of competition, they get good offers, they get good prices. Alternatively, when you look at some of the less served neighborhoods, you see they're, they're not as valuable as consumers, they're, they don't have um, a lot of buying power, and so there's not a lot of competition in those spaces, and as a result, prices are higher, um, not, a lot of not a lot of competitors in retail go into those locations, and as a result, you have these de food deserts where there are no, no fresh groceries and, and, um, for, those, for those communities. And you can see it, it, it's a, there's a parallel, right? So the, it's the outcome of extreme <coughs> targeting. If you start targeting more and more, you're going to, th there's there's a gravitation toward the valuable consumers 
however you want to define the valuable consumers. Um, and so that goes back to my earlier uh, discussion of one of uh, broadening some of your targeting efforts to try and reach serendipitous consumers who don't fit the profile. I want to just I want to take that because there's something that Mark touched on <coughs> earlier, which is there's a separate conversation, which is advertising provides an important social function of making content available to people for free and funding important you know public services and public goods. And that becomes, I guess, the next challenge for advertisers, which is making the decision. Like, not everything is, programmatics of buying method. It's not a way we think about buying things. And we do do brand advertising in digital. It's not all sort of over-targeted and driven that way. But there's a bigger question, which is, where does, where does the bulk of advertising money get weighted and spend? And where do other organizations like news organizations miss out? Because money's just shifted away from them. And how do you ensure that advertising funds everything because as much as I'd love infinite advertising budgets I don't I have finite advertising budgets audiences are finite as well and campaign cycles are finite what I am increasingly aware of is how do we ensure that we fund appropriate content and serve the communities which buy our products as well as ensuring that we don't in drive dominance of opinion or views into certain pockets of the advertising industry Oh, yeah, I'm sorry, so, so I want to agree with Joshua about one thing, which is uh, advertisers do have alternatives, especially about data. But from, a, from an antitrust perspective, if, uh, if Google winds up being a necessary part of a buy and Facebook winds up being a necessary part of a buy, that is to say there are customers that you just can't reach without using that particular platform. That is, that gives them dominance in a market, and then that says there's lots of things they can't do to extend that dominance. One of those things might be buying other companies that would actually give them even more powers, things like that. So, so even if uh, advertisers actually do have a fair amount of alternatives, and both Google and Facebook achieve their market power through legitimate means, that is not through, through something illegal, uh, nonetheless, there may be impl implications from uh, the necessity that the, uh, that advertisers face in using those platforms. So, um, I would just, uh, uh, again, coming back to programmatic and ad networks and maybe talking a little bit about what, what Josh was raising. I mean, the bottom line, and, 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 and come to, I mean, the bottom line is uh, display advertising online has been completely commoditized. It's, it's practically dead, okay? Um, and the reason you're reading about BuzzFeed laying off 200 people, even though they were the darling of the advertising world, uh, is, I am sure, in no small part because of, of things like that. Uh, programmatic has allowed uh, a concentration of power in the hands of a handful of ad networks, um, which in and of itself might not be bad, but let me give you a Breitbart specific example. But please understand this example is not limited to Breitbart. Um, after President Trump was elected, this may come as a complete shock to people in this room, a lot of people were very, 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 and I mean very upset, so maybe you know some of them. Um, some of those people run and control ad networks. <coughs> in November of 16, there was a customer that did almost 10 million impressions on Breitbart. To be clear, they did not place direct buys on Breitbart. These were programmatic buys. But the customers they wanted to reach were on Breitbart. Their advertising on Breitbart was successful, and it had been for years because these were long time advertisers. Uh, so clearly that's where the ad networks representing the advertiser was bidding to reach those customers. I looked at that same advertiser in November of 2017. That advertiser did only 6,000 <coughs> impressions on Breitbart. It took me a long time, but I got to people who could answer the question for me at this advertiser. Um, and here's the bottom line. This advertiser never boycotted Breitbart and never complained that its ads were on Breitbart. They had no idea that their advertising was being blocked from Breitbart <coughs> and not reaching their customers on Breitbart's website. 
So what happened? After 2016, a bunch of ad networks got together and for openly and admitted political reasons, blocked programmatic buying on Breitbart. And they did so without telling at least some of their advertisers who had never complained. And they did it despite the fact that advertising on Breitbart had been successful for years. And it was for purely political reasons. Breitbart has, is a new site. Their, the editorial position is openly conservative. And people were pissed Trump won. And frankly, they wanted to take it out on somebody. So stop and, 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 and think and take Breitbart out of that and give it to your favorite news site or your favorite opinion site, right? I think that should bother everybody. Now that wasn't maybe an unintended consequence of pro programmatic, but that should bother anybody. I told you in the beginning, I approach this from a very simple standpoint. I like the free flow of information and ideas. Ideas should be iterated upon, discussed, and that makes a better democracy. And I think Josh was referring to, um, and I could be wrong, so jump in, the fact that a lot of news companies are not able to sustain investigative journalism on digital dollars, digital advertising dollars. But I would strongly suggest that if solutions are looked into that, those solutions not be Facebook and Google or anyone else saying, well, we'll fund the investigative journalism now we understand. Because those are all companies with strong viewpoints. And that would, I believe, that would result in a terrible result. A free uh, media that relies and can fund itself through advertising is a safeguard. We should cherish it. We don't want big companies coming in and solving the problem that they've helped create by saying, well, we'll give these people money because we like their journalism. We won't give people money because we don't like their journalism. Thank you. Um, I have, there are two other topics I want to make sure that we cover um, before we wrap, it, wrap up in the next 10 minutes or so. But before I do that, uh, does anybody have any responses on the, the power of the ad networks or anything like that? Uh, one thing I would point out. Um, it, it has happened recently that um, major companies have uh, bought ad networks, major content companies. I'm referring specifically to uh, the Time Warner merger. Uh, a lot of you might know a company, AppNexus. It was bought by um, the company, and so um, I think, I just put a placeholder in it, I think that raises a number of questions as ad networks begin to get bought and folded into larger companies that are also content providers for another day. I, I, I'll just add on to that again. You know, in the spirit of clarification, like I, I I'm not going to comment on the uh, on the blacklisting. You know, that's uh, that's I'll, I'll stay clear from that. Um, but in terms of of ad networks, a company like AppNexus and you know the Trade Desk. I mean, it's important to understand sort of um, my definition of an ad network is a company that is aggregating supply. And arbitraging, um, and they're they're sort of identifying a gap in the marketplace, and they're saying, okay, I'm going to cobble together a network, and I'm going to sell it to the demand side, and uh, the, I'm going to take a, a piece of, of, of what I put uh, bring back to the publisher. And I think AppNexus and, and others that are in the programmatic space are not only you know they they aggregate supply, but they are the technology pipes that lead to the demand side. So it's really important to differentiate between. Is it demand side? Is it supply side? And it, and you know the 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 programmatic space used to be three pieces. It used to be demand side, exchange, and supply. And supply and exchange have consolidated um, in the last few years. And and um, so I, I I think it's important to know that. I also think just objectively and again like Dish doesn't have a horse in this race in terms of like display based websites. But having worked in that that's that uh, on that side of the business. It's really, it's a this display digital advertising is really challenging for publishers that are sub whatever million. Um, it's really hard. I mean, that, that market is dominated by uh, players that, that have scaled audiences, that have uh, uh, ease of, of solutions in terms of buying, 
um, and it's tough. It's very, very difficult. And that, that has driven, in my point of view, sort of the, uh, what, what's been happening to BuzzFeed and, and Vice and folks like that. Thanks, Adam. Um, so I want to uh, ask you all about something that came up several times during the earlier panel. Um, you know, and maybe we'll start with you, Joshua. Um, you know, there are numerous observers have raised concerns about digital advertising. And um, during the previous panel, we heard from, from Mark Pritchard about PNG's uh, concerns about ad fraud and brand safety. Uh, and you know, how do those problems play into your decision on which channel to use uh, digital versus traditional media? And, and what is, do you have a sense of what the industry is doing to address those problems? Okay. Uh, so there are two, they're two separate issues. So on the ad fraud, and I, I'm going to encompass in that also things like quality, such as viewability and ensuring the ad is like even if your ad seen by a human, has it actually been seen in a way that has an impact? It's not the 0.7 of a second. Uh, so we, so the industry uses third-party verification companies for that that are accredited by the Media Ratings Council or, or others around the world. Uh, we negotiate the contracts with uh, media partners so that neither our clients nor we are on the hook for ads that are delivered to non-humans. So there's, we call it invalid traffic, IVT or SIVT, sophisticated invalid traffic. And what happens is if the third party verifications detect fraud, so that comes out in the report in a buy, we say we're not paying for those fraudulent impressions and then I get back to that time constraint, we either have to get those impressions credited back to make it make good for the advertiser or the bill gets reduced so we don't pay for it. On the, and that covers quality as well. So we might buy against viewability metrics and we say that the ad has to not only be seen by a human, but we want the ad seen for a certain amount of time. There's all sorts of third party tools that account for that and we might pay a premium to ensure that's delivered. On the brand safety side of things, that's a lot more complicated because Again, we use third-party tools to manage for brand safety. Uh, what we talk, one of the things I developed in the industry is the Advertiser Protection Bureau, the APB, and that's a consortium of all the agency holding groups through the four A's. We actually share information about brand safety incidents, so if an ad appears in front of an ISIS video, it's not just the advertiser that gets exposed that has to worry about it, all the agencies get alerted, and that way we can hold a publisher accountable and get that video taken down. Uh, safety covers though a myriad of sins because you have the ISIS video which no one wants to be against and then you might have the oft used example is the airplane crash that airlines don't want to be against and both uh, brand safety concerns for various advertisers. That becomes much more complex and difficult to manage and when you get to user join array content on YouTube or Instagram or Snapchat it becomes another problem. and so. One of the big conversations we have at the moment with the industry is that advertising's a privilege, not a right. I don't have infinite budgets. You need to have safe and quality environments and a lot of the pressure needs to be taken off not only just the agency and the advertiser, because we're trying to police for all of that, a lot of the pressure has to also go back to the publisher and the, pu the advertising environment because when I grew up in traditional media in TV and print, when we had a breaking news event, we would go dark in advertising because we knew it wasn't a safe environment. We need much more responsibility taken on the digital side for that, but I also would say you need a lot more responsibility taken on the regulatory front side of things because, and I'll point to the Christchurch example, which was a terrible tragedy. There was no ads running in front of that content, which was, you know, from an advertiser perspective, that's great. The platforms were slow at taking that content down, which is terrible. But then you've got bad actors that continue to publish that content. You need a lot more regulatory action being taken against individuals that publish bad content online because bad actors will always be incentivized to break rules. And unless you take those bad actors and punish them for their bad behavior, like I'm constantly playing whack-a-mole and the platforms will be constantly <coughs> held accountable for people that have got bad behavior that will not care that the platforms are being held accountable, you need to get the bad actors penalized as well. And, and Greg, um, yeah. are mobile marketers thinking about these issues the same way? Yeah, listen, you know, it's funny. I think, uh, you know, the digital world, I've been doing digital now for over 20 years, and it's a wild and wooly place. There's no question that there's a little bit of an old uh, 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 old West mentality there that um, that complicates uh, sort of marketers as we figure out new things. And as I think Joshua makes a good point, you know, bad actors, for whatever reason, 
have now been given access to all sorts of things that they never would have access before internet. Um, we actually have launched both uh, brand safety for CMOs to really help them figure out how they manage that significantly better. I will be honest with you, I'm a little surprised the number of CMOs who did not have a brand safety. I mean, like, to the best of my knowledge, there is only one brand safety officer at a major corporation who has that actual specific title. Joshua, maybe you know a couple more, but it's limited in a way that I'm surprised at. The other thing around fraud, I mean, fraud has really been a desktop issue, and it is a very serious one and needs to be addressed. I, so you, um, the data suggests that it, we guess it will probably come mobile's way here as mobile's now become sort of much more dominant. Um, and we're still trying to figure out sort of, there's just a lot of creative people who want to do bad stuff. And so I think there just needs to be an increasingly concerted effort to call out the PNG and, and other adverse uh, Unilever is my chairman, and, you know, the work that we do there to try to aggressively work against that. It's hard to keep up with, admittedly, uh, but I think that there's been some progress. It's funny, these verification companies didn't exist five years ago, and they're each now, there's three of them that are probably 600, 700 employees. So they've come a long ways in sort of getting better. It's too slow, but getting better. So we are nearly out of time, but there is just one last topic I wanted to make sure that we um, get to, and that's uh, convergence. So maybe, Kevin, I'm going to go back to you on this, because, um, you know, companies like Sling are obvious, or, or, or Dish are in an interesting position since, as you said, they really are at the crossroads of traditional TV and digital TV. And so I, I, I'd be curious to hear what kind of convergence you're seeing uh, between online and offline TV advertising. Uh, well, we're, we're seeing a lot. I mean, I, I think, um, you know, I think it ties predominantly to, you know, another topic that we we're covering, which is data. And, and, you know, there's, there's, there's obviously, you know, there's an issue around data leakage, but there, there is a big opportunity, I think, for, uh, for organizations that, that do have uh, compelling first party data um, to, you know, partner together or to, to, to properly mine that and leverage it uh, with their advertising partners and agency partners. Um, and, and that is kind of the critical piece to all things advanced, uh, advanced television advertising related. Uh, as, it, as it speaks to DISH, I mean, you know, I, we, we uh, were first to the market in terms of selling uh, cross-platform addressable. So what does that mean? That means that uh, we work with any given marketer or agency and, and we put together the DISH footprint and we put together the Sling footprint. And if someone is looking for an in-market uh, uh, truck buyer, um, you know, we, we cobble it together. We don't sort of, uh, we don't differentiate between, oh, this is, this is uh, sort of linear television and satellite based and this is OTT. We just look at as we have, we have that are very, uh, very, very little uh, duplication, but we have a, a subscriber footprint that we put together that we bring to the market as one. Um, so I, I think that's one version of convergence. I do think that, uh, I know measurement was, was mentioned in the earlier panel. Uh, we, we, we have been working with uh, Comscore on a cross-platform addressable measurement, which is great. Um, so there, there are things that are coming that allow the, the demand side uh, and, and marketers to, to view something sort of holistically. I think that's really, really important. Um, but we see convergence as uh, something that is happening and something that will continue to happen. And, and, and actually another level of convergence um, I think is you know, when you when you look at the power of Facebook and Google and Amazon, it's you know again, it's one platform that has massive scale. You know, we that's why we need to start getting our 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 uh, our, our you know measurement and and definitions all sorted because there needs to be you know there needs to be a, a consortium continued you know sort of consortium effort around uh, television and OTT to to bring it together because television is still super effective, um, and if you can if you can make it easier for the market. Uh, to, to, to buy, whether it's local, regional, national. Um, so I, I think convergence, I look at it as convergence of linear and digital, but also convergence of, of uh, and I think technology would be the key catalyst for that, convergence of, of what, what have been competitors um, to sort of consortium collaborators. Thank you. Any, any final thoughts on convergence? I just want to add that I guess the last pillar of that convergence is the convergence of commerce, because we're seeing the integration of like data, media, and then connecting it to the commerce side of things, and that's going to be the next big battleground. Yep. And I, th I think this goes back to this idea of um, how much visibility you have in the consumer. Right. The, the key really is the data. So we've been talking about internet, occasionally about mobile, and 
that's starting to come, that, that data start, starting to come together and you can get a, um, a cross-platform cross or cross-device profile of the consumer. Once we start bringing in TV, if you have a smart TV and Google is on that, all the TV viewership behavior starts bringing, coming in as well and that adds to the, the, their accuracy of their profile for the consumer. Um, one thing that we haven't talked about as much are the broadband providers that um, someone mentioned, uh, Time Warner. Uh, they also have access to the data, but they haven't been <coughs> playing the same internet game uh, along with Google and Facebook up until. But they do sell the data. <coughs> so others are buying the data to, to do even like uh, magazines and well, so that's on. That's a whole I mean, Karina, in some regards, this is kind of, I think, if I maybe even summarize a little bit, I think the challenge that we're having is that a business that's in deep in innovation and change, I mean, it is more dynamic. I've been doing this a lot of years, and I've been in the heart of it, and I'm shocked at how much it changes, how quickly. And so we do need to find some balance in that sort of innovation development for the better, for the greater good, the things that were talked about in the previous panel, versus, I think, as Larry's trying to point out others, you know, there are unintended consequences of some of that, and so the degree which we sort of manage against those. I, we don't even profess to have those answers, but um, it's uh, it definitely a very interesting business right now. There's no question about that. Sure. Well, smartphones were adopted really fast, but smart TVs are going really slowly. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. But I think part of the, obviously, the dynamism of this industry is one of the reasons we wanted to make sure to hold this, this workshop. Um, given the, the hour, I think we will forego audience questions. I apologize for that. but. Um, Hope you will all uh, come back tomorrow for the second portion of our uh, competition in television and digital advertising workshop. And um, before you go, though, I just would like you to thank all of our panelists. For the <coughs>